Hey everybody, what's up, Throttlers? We have a very special guest, TV film writer Evan Ball. And uh, guess what? We're going to talk about some Star Wars, because that's what we love to talk about on the show, and that's what we love to talk about <laughs> with Evan Ball, friend of the show. Evan, how are you, man? I'm happy to be back, man. We had a really fun conversation the first time, and I'm I'm flattered to be considered friend of the show, man. Of course. It's, you're it's quite the honor. You might even get your own bobblehead pretty soon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> watch time. out, man. We had the Mandalorian start two weeks ago today, so we're amidst Star Wars. And we were talking about Mando probably last week, and uh, we were talking about Rogue One, and you were in the chat. You were saying you had yeah. some thoughts on Rogue One. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm hardest on the movies I think have the most potential. To me, Rogue One could have been brilliant. And I think when you see it, there are seeds of that brilliance within it. I have a strict two criteria for when I'm judging a movie or a TV show or anything like that. One, does it deliver on what it promises? Mm -hmm. Now the promise is a combination of what happens in act one and the marketing. You wanna be able to avoid the marketing, but like you kind of mentally can't. When you go into the movie, you do have some expectations based on what you've seen. But two is, is the movie or TV show or whatever, is it internally consistent? The rules that they set up, do they follow those rules? The characters that they create, do those characters stay in character, et cetera? And you know, hmm. you're allowed to yeah. have twists and turns, but like it's gotta make sense within the world that they build. The biggest issue for me is that Rogue One breaks number two. And I think it's because it's trying to be two movies at once. The idea of Rogue One in the first half of the movie is, hey, the Star Wars universe is very kind of morally black and white. It's obvious good versus obvious bad, whatever, right? And we want to tell a war story in the Star Wars universe that is willing to dive into the gray area. The kind of dirty things that the Rebel Alliance has to do to kind of get yeah. a one up on the Empire, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? That concept of a movie is brilliant and fascinating and everything I wanted out of Rogue One. Right. But then we start getting into the second movie that they want to make. And that's the movie about this inspirational, unlikely heroine that kind of helps the Rebel Alliance become valid and get its first one-up big victory on the Empire and goes back into this obvious good or obvious evil movie. Yeah. And it does it in such an abrupt turn. You know, they treat Jen Erso like shit because she's a criminal and whatever, and they threaten to give her back to the empire. You lead up to the fact that they're like, okay, they, they found where her dad is. He's on this planet where with all his research goons and all that stuff. The whole rebel Alliance sends a bombing <laughs> campaign and murders her dad anyway. Yes. And then not three minutes later, she's leading an emotional speech, inspiring the rebel Alliance to do rebel Alliance thing and take the fight to the bad guys. And she should hate the Rebel Alliance. Right. Her parents were rebels, but then it got her mom killed. Her dad abandoned her. Right. She finds out her dad's still alive and is a good guy. And then she's like, hey, let's not kill my dad. And they're like, no, don't worry. We're going to handle this. And then they kill her dad anyway. Huh. Yeah. She should hate them. She should be like, you're no better than the Empire. You obviously aren't on the moral, like, high ground of this right you're shitty i'm out but because they need her to be the like leader of the second half of the movie right. they just kind of like skim by it yeah and she's like nah but he told me that that star is bad and that's kind of worse than you guys murdering my dad so if you're not going to be the good guy i will and then we get the second movie which is you know very there's no gray area this is bad this is good she's the leader she's the unlikely hero but she does it anyway that turn is something that i just like it mentally breaks me when right. i watch the movie that makes so much sense <laughs> there are there, <laughs> there are so many moments in that movie where it does feel like it's fighting it against itself the thing about the mandalorian that i do love is that it, we are exploring that area of a power vacuum which is so much what i wanted the sequel trilogy to be once we jump into Episode 7, The Force Awakens, it's just like, nope, there's a new Republic and everything's great. The thing about Force Awakens that is frustrating is they're, they're trying so hard to replicate a, a new hope that we get, we get a situation where there's presumably a new Republic, but there's not like a new Republic army. 
you know, like there's apparently peace and prosperity, but it's, you know, it's not like, it, you know, the United Nations exists and there's this coalition of army of people who are like, we remember the empire. We don't want that to happen again. Right. When we go to, um, why can't I remember what, uh, what Ray's planet is? Detroit. <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> when we go to Detroit, right? Uh, Jakku. We, we get, Jakku, yeah. yeah. We get the sense that there's already kind of first order control. Mm-hmm. When we go to all these various star systems, there's first order control. Like they're the dominant power player in all these other different places. And then the only time we don't see that is when they unleash Starkiller base and destroy, you know, like four or five systems of apparently prosperous, whatever. But it's this massive galaxy and there's apparently a new Republic or something like that. And like, there's no retaliation for that. It's like, it's up to this small group of rebels again. Right. Whether it's a power vacuum, which would have been so fascinating, be like, you know, the empires in shambles leading various different groups to try to vie for galactic control. That's fascinating. Yes. Or if there is like a standard new republic and it's like the prequels, like the prequels did a good job with the old republic and being like, here's the order. Here's how like the Sith are insurgents Mm -hmm. and here's how they manipulate things. And it was a different story than we got in the kind of main trilogy. Um, that that would have been really nice. What I do love about the Mandalorian and how they handled that too is that the New Republic, the X-wings for the New Republic, are the police for the New Republic, and like you're on a ship and it feels strangely imperial, but it is the New Republic because yeah. it's like lighter colors and blue. But you're like, this is actually really cool because they're playing with the idea of the politics. Mm-hmm. of being in power again being the per- people in power also painting the new republic as not all good it's like well yes the mandalorian he's kind of going around and just fending for himself so much of the original kind of star wars uh doctrine and inspiration comes from westerns and like ronin samurai style films and things like that yeah. it's so nice to see mandalorian just really lean heavy into that again well, that's what i really liked about the first episode of the f- this season was just it was like it is straight up being what it knows that uh, (laughs) no hesitation (laughs) exactly it was just like george lucas was so explicit about what it should be he was like i love kurosawa i love spaghetti westerns flash gordon let's Mm -hmm. push this let's all smush this together the cool thing about how john favreau and dave filoni are working with the mandalorian is that yeah. george lucas is he's within earshot all the time i think they keep him around as kind of a good luck charm to sort of get his tacit blessing on whatever they're mm-hmm. doing and i think that that's what's reading it's so interesting to hear you talk about george lucas with such reverence um rightfully so i think after the prequels people were just shitting on george lucas yeah. the prequels are not the best films i'm not going to come out here and say that but what they are is consistent and there's a clear clarity of vision. Yes, yeah. the acting is largely bad. Yes, the dialogue is largely bad. You can nitpick those films to death, but it know, that trilogy knows what it is. That trilogy knows it's the corruption of Anakin Skywalker. It knows it's the rise of uh, Palpatine to become the Emperor. And it knows all the big tentpole moments along the way. It knows 100% what it is. Yeah. And that's George Lucas, I always say he has original ideas for better or for worse. And we saw mm-hmm. what, what the worst <laughs> was with the prequels. But guess what? There's a lot of ideas in there. There's lots of ideas still. Part of what Mandalorian, uh, especially that first episode, got so got done so well was, I don't know if you're a uh, Trekkie at all, but part of what's so fun Huge. about Star Trek is you meet new cultures and you're seeing kind of how... The, the friction between different cultures clashing up against each other. Yeah. And Mandalorian gives us that. It's like, you know, the little Western town culture who hates the sand people, the sand people who finally get to be like realized as like a whole complete culture and not just right. savages in the desert yeah. who have their own wants and needs and, and like can communicate more than just grunts. It does so well of exploring those things. And hopefully more of Star Wars kind of follows that lead going forward, using the breadth of the universe to kind of do some self-examination. Like Game of Thrones, I would like to see the Mandalorian or Star Wars television shows to have lots of sects. Not sex, <laughs> but sects. S-E-C-T. S-E-C-T. Yes. <laughs> 
I would like to see lots of sects so that you can have these groups that we actually care about. And they all are kind of grayish. And we we yeah. like some things about them. We don't like some things about them. We hate this character. And then we learn to love them. And then vice versa with other characters. That's the thing that I find the most satisfying on long form stories. Christiana oh, Hooks says she loves listening to the two uh, you two talk more of this combo please you will absolutely get more of this combo if uh, Evan is so gracious to come back I would love to have <laughs> you back anytime to talk about all these fun things these nerdy fun things so thank you guys for joining us thank you Evan you're an Thanks, awesome everybody. guest you have Aristotle so much come on man you're you're a great host you're a fun guy I'm I'm lucky to be on the show dude Oh, come on, man. Well, thanks, man. This is so much fun. It's it's always a good time when you're here. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, and, everybody. Uh, see you later.